Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline, and today uh, we continue our post ASAP 22 efforts uh, with folks that uh, weren't quite able to catch up with live and in person. Uh, but a guest that has been with us before, and that's actually a theme that I'm seeing here, is we're actually seeing a number of uh, folks that have been frequent guests that we weren't able to catch up at ASAP 22. So, doc, uh, Dr. Nathan Schlicker, who's uh, byline starts to read like a nurse managers with the MDJD, uh, former state senator, all of those things that he has done uh, and accomplished. But he's one of our go-tos for sure with regard to the legal beagle aspect of healthcare and medicine. And today we're referring to a talk he gave from practice to penitentiary, um, some of the potholes and things that may land a physician behind bars, which every jail needs a physician. So, you know. Just be on the opposite side of it, unfortunately. Uh, but we're going to talk about some of those things, some various aspects, talk about some of the uh, uh, legal decisions, things that have gone down, some things we can do to protect ourselves, uh, and then maybe some horizon-based stuff, because one thing that I definitely want to talk about is this new tactic out there by legislation, uh, by legislators and legislation to criminalize health care as a way to add a stick uh, to the legislation and it basically says if you do this you can go to jail as opposed to and often forgetting that there's an MTAL uh, obligation by our physicians. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Schlicker, thanks again for joining us uh, here on the podcast West Coast Style. So glad we didn't have to get you up too early, uh, but uh, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for uh, having me again. I, I guess uh, hanging out with you is my version of recidivism and uh, going back to podcast jail. So great to be here and look forward to a Fun and exciting conversation about uh, how we can go to jail uh, the real way, uh, or hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, that this if if this podcast is considered your your podcast jail, then this is a white collar crime because it's you're getting your you're getting your square meals, your picks, and your leather couches. So uh, let's give us a background. Okay, dive into uh, the idea of practice to penitentiary. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're seeing, and you touched on in your opening comments, is that the criminalization of healthcare uh, is really starting to happen on a more frequent basis. Uh, and at least making the news media and in some splashy ways more. <clears throat> what I think though, you know, is also going on is there's kind of a, a rebargaining of a social contract uh, and uh, the professionalism of many parts of our society that historically didn't get involved in the criminal system. I think we're seeing that right now uh, with uh, police officers that historically, you know, we're not charged with criminal issues. And we're seeing that now happen as we're reevaluating the, you know, the blue wall. And I think the same way we are reevaluating the white coat wall and a lot of other areas of society that historically were devoid of criminal oversight. Yes, there was civil litigation. Yes, there was professional actions. You could lose your license. You could lose your badge. Um, but you didn't intersect with the criminal system because what you did was so different, so unique, it was almost impossible to criminalize, or that was kind of the prevailing social thought. And now we're in this world where we're reevaluating and saying, well, no, there is a line. I can't always tell you what it is black and white, but we are going to talk about criminal elements when care goes so far out of the, the norm. But out of that has also come the idea of, well, wait a minute, if this isn't sacrosanct. If, if the practice of medicine is not outside of the criminal realm, how else can we use that to our benefit, says the politicians, and start criminalizing things like abortion access and putting doctors as the enforcers, not just the police of the laws. And so that is a new avenue. So we've kind of got two things. We've got the, the fall away of the white coat protection for criminalization, and we've got the weaponization of criminalization and healthcare uh, that are going on that are creating two interesting paths forward that are a challenge for us on the front line. You're actually talking about two separate, like the far ends of that spectrum. You know, you've got the idea that as a physician or a police officer that you are protected from any type of legal responsibility. And we talked about that uh, when we did um, uh, the Vanderbilt podcast together. Uh, talking about that aspect of things of saying these are how many steps were ignored in terms of warnings and when does when does you know just the making a mistake turn to gross negligence which clearly gets us to potential of harm with civil litigation but then gets to an actual criminal act um, with that potential intent on harm or breaking the law uh, but then also with 
talking about that legislation of turning physicians into a policing agency or making them afraid to actually provide healthcare needed services of weighing what is within the Hippocratic Oath of what we, uh, how we serve our patients with the idea of I'm concerned about my personal livelihood and safety. Uh, let's, let's bounce into that. Uh, the first, let's talk about um, you know, that, that breaking and pushing the law because we've seen uh, recently, we've seen, of course, the, the civil litigations, but now, especially with the opioid, opioid epidemic, actually seeing physicians charged uh, on the local, state, and federal level uh, for crimes uh, and even murder in that case. Um, kind of walk through some of that, uh, some of that evolution and in, in what it means to us. Definitely. I think what you're, we're seeing in the opioid epidemic is a great example because you have things on, on the range uh, in, in kind of a big splay of what it is that we're criminalizing. On the one end, we've got the pill mills where you're pumping out scripts, you know, and it, oftentimes those are federal charges, you know, a number of them, you know, West Virginia comes to mind, uh, where we're just pumping out an obscene number of scripts. And you can say there's really no way that you didn't know what you were doing. And then we've seen it on the individual level with the Lisa Sane cases in California, where uh, we've got murder charges because at the end of the day, an individual was prescribing more to a group of individuals that they had a reason to know, uh, they had a reason to to believe were you know fundamentally misusing that prescription. In her case, there was episodes where those individuals um, were. Uh, you know, caught basically selling their prescriptions, went to jail and then got out of jail and she re-prescribed them. There was one instance where, you know, she couldn't give a patient any more uh, opioids due to uh, regulations. So she wrote a prescription for the husband. So there you've got, again, a willful and want to that criminal intent. And, uh, you know, just to step back and when people think about civil versus criminal litigation, the difference between civil and criminal, civil is that, you know, you got to have a duty, you got to breach it, and you have to have a, a harm. With criminal law, the key things are you have to have the physical act, the mental thought process, and that's where most crimes hang, in a way, and then, you know, the harm that, that results from that. Uh, so, you know, in the case of murder, you know, you've got to do the, there has to be a dead body at the end of it, I always say. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you've got to have the mindset though that resulted in that. You know, we're, we're around and doing things when a lot of dead bodies show up as ER docs, right? You know, they, we're doing codes. There's a dead body at the end of it. We're not committing murder. You know, there was no criminal intent involved in that. The mental state wasn't there. In contrast, in the case of Dr. Sang and others in the opioid epidemic, there was a dead body at the end, the, the what we call the actus reus, uh, Latin was there. The mens re, the mental state, was also there because there was a willful and wanton approach to medical care that resulted in that harm. And so that, I think, is what is starting to change is that we're starting to evaluate how physicians are practicing and saying, is the mental state there to criminalize the individual? We can all say the opioid pill mill because that's a black and white thing, you know, the number of scripts there. But the individual care is, do we have the mental state? Do we have the thought process, that gross negligence, that willful and wanton, um, or the deliberate intent uh, you know, of a first degree murder uh, to criminalize the individual's care? Uh, and I think that's where the, the conversation is really going. And, and the opioid epidemic opened that door, but now we're seeing it in other areas as well. This is a very interesting discussion because a lot of people are going to say, you know, even with the opioid, they didn't specifically, you know, going to say, well, murder, I have to have willfully wanton intent to take somebody's life. But it doesn't necessarily mean that my mission as prescribing was that I meant to, to, to kill people, or even as a drug dealer, it isn't necessarily to kill people. It is, yeah, that is, you know, kind of business. It, it, even though, interestingly, you know, talking with uh, Sam Kenyonis, you know, that is pushing that envelope of, of, of the interest because it goes so far that, you know, it, it's that strong and, and potent. But, you know, with, resort, with regard to the physicians, um, how do you, you um, how do you make that leap? Because they say, well, they didn't intend to kill them. But how do we make that leap from the, we want to say that the, the we won't say the dead body, but the chalk line, you know, the chalk line at the end of the rainbow. How do we make that leap from the intent of profiteering, making a profit, 
prescribing those opioids to that end result of the chalk line and making that the actual intent and connection of a criminal act. Well, and that's what you're getting at is the mens rea, the, the, uh, the mental thought process to commit the crime. And so the mens rea changes the charge. So the idea of deliberate intent is first degree murder. That's the, the top bar, right? Uh, so that's only the top bar. You can go down from there, second degree murder generally, and, and each jurisdiction is different. So always know the laws in your state, standard lawyer disclaimer. But you know uh, the second degree murder is generally a willful and wanton uh, standard. Uh, and the idea is that you, know, you recklessly basically proceed it um, down the road of, of your decision making. You know, and then there's gross negligence, which generally translates into a manslaughter charge, you know, and uh, then in some di- jurisdictions, there's also uh, what's just called strict liability, which is that if X happened, then it's a crime. Uh, you know, the classic one I, I use that it's not very often in medicine, um, although I think it will come up in our later conversation about criminalization of healthcare. But, uh, you know, historically it's not been there, but I tell people, you know, it, it, statutory rape is the example that it, is most black and white. It doesn't matter what you were thinking, you know, if you're an adult and you slept with a 12 year old kid, it doesn't matter what your, your mental thought process was. It's a black and white standard, not going to happen. That's a crime. We're done with the conversation. So, uh, you know, that's strict liability in, in most jurisdictions. There is a, a kind of level for that uh, in homicide, but also in other crimes. And the other one is felony murder uh, that comes up in opioids. If you're committing another crime and somebody dies, then it can be usually second or third uh, degree murder in most jurisdictions. So in that regards, uh, you know, it it does, uh, you know, there are different levels. And so you don't have to deliberately intend because that would be first degree murder. But if you're reckless, if you're negligent and where that negligence, we talk about negligence all the time in civil litigation, becomes criminal is a challenge. And that's the the thing I think we're battling with right now is when is it civil negligence? What is it criminal negligence? And what you alluded to is profiteering, you know, the the intent in a way to do something other than provide medical care. And I think that's what we're seeing kind of tip that level over. Uh, Because we can all think of examples of, of negligent things that happen in life that end up in harm. You know, that's why vehicular manslaughter exists, because you were driving drunk. You didn't intend to go out and kill anyone, but you were drunk driving after the hospital's gala and you hit somebody and they died. Right. You know, that that kind of thing happens. You didn't have a criminal intent to hurt somebody, but you recklessly put yourself in that situation and resulted in the harm to another. So uh, I think that's where we're going to have to figure out what that line is between civil and criminal. And my general answer to most folks is, as long as you're doing things for the right reason, it should stay in the civil side of things. If you're doing it for profiteering, for reputation, because you thought it'd be really cool to do something crazy, I write it up in a journal, who knows, then that's probably not a good place to be. But if you're doing the right thing for the patient, and yes, a harm happens. Uh, You're an ER doc and the patient comes in, they're a hospice patient, they've been taking fentanyl, they're at end of life and you give them 10 oxycodone or whatever, and they overdose because that was their intent to overdose and harm themselves. I, I don't think that's a criminal issue. I don't even think that's a civil issue, to be quite honest. But you know, if we want to talk about it, your intent was to provide the right care. And as long as that's always your driving motivation to do the right thing, then I don't think often we'll be in that criminal side. And that's an interesting relation there. You know, With the opioid, a lot of it is a criminal act that led to another bad outcome, um, you know, your, your thought is making the money doing something that is clearly against the uh, regulations, knowing the risks involved, and then have another secondary bad outcome. And we, of course, we see that with, you know, just say carjackings or robbery that end up with somebody getting injured or killed, uh, that automatically that becomes part of that uh, connection. But here in healthcare, and we've seen this with that discussion, if you haven't heard that podcast that we did uh, on the, it actually turn, has turned out to be one of the most listened to of 2022 um, with the Vanderbilt uh, Vanderbilt nurse trial um, and talking about that fine line because now we have a lot of physicians and nurses and other staff that are afraid of potential criminal exposure. And what's interestingly, the fear of criminal exposure is greater for many than the actual civil exposure, which we all face every single day. 
um, kind of frame that idea of, you know, that where you mentioned that gray point of negligence and malpractice to actual crossing that line to the criminal aspect of things. And for those out there that are right now paralyzed with concern about that exposure of kind of alleviating those fears for 99.99% of physicians, nurses, and healthcare professionals. Definitely. And I think you know, the podcast could really dove into a lot of this uh, you know, in more detail, but kind of at the high level, the thing I would remind folks is that generally there's one of these sensational cases a year, maybe two. So your risk is one in 300 million in the United States. So it's not exactly a, a huge you know, likelihood that you'll be involved in one. But in every one of these instances, you know, there was a an intent external, uh, you know, in the opioid epidemics, to profiteer, to <clears throat> recklessly disregard. And in the case of Redonda Vought and the Vanderbilt instance, there there was, you know, a, a reckless disregard, uh, so to speak, for multiple safety checks. So uh, again, I, I think if you're thinking about what am I doing to make sure that I am doing the right thing for the right reason. Am I providing the medical care that I would want for my family member and you know, discussing that with the, the patient? And am I following the safety protocols that are in my institution and paying attention? And I know we all are inundated with an, an obscene number of new change alerts, best practice alerts, safety Kaizen processes. I mean, they, they feel like they're coming out of our ears. They're so prevalent. And I work in the quality and safety side of things. So I share the pain on both sides of this experience as a practicing ER doc and the one asking you to make the change. Uh, But I think it's a reminder that these things exist for a reason. And we're doing this work to improve the quality of care. So if it's there, we should pay attention. Uh, And if it's not being used and it's being uh, a distraction and being overridden, as was the multiple warnings in the instance of the Vanderbilt case, uh, then you know we should reevaluate: Are those safety checks actually working and pulling them out? At some point, you know, we as healthcare, and I use that in the royal we sense, we have to reevaluate all the things that we have put in place because some of them don't make sense anymore. If we go back just to the medicine of it. Let's take sepsis carry, early goal directed therapy. When I was young, you know, and uh, naive, it was everybody gets intubated, a central line, an art line. They get, you know, blood transfusion if their hemoglobin's low, you know, all this stuff, right? And basically now we've rolled it down to everybody needs antibiotics and fluids might be a good idea. <laughs> like that's the sum total of sepsis care. Like we used to do all this stuff. We have to reevaluate likewise and all the safety stuff that we do if it's not working and get rid of the stuff that's not helping and maybe doing harm. But what's in your system, you should know, and you should advocate for change if it's necessary, but you should follow it and work to do your best care because at the end of the day, those things are there for a reason. So as we talked about then, I I hope that the the Vanderbilt case is a re-spurring of attention to that safety and quality initiative, that this isn't just stuff that goes on a wall and yeah, we talk about it at Huddle and whatever, or it's an email that you delete and you don't pay attention to your hospital email, email as ER docs because that's the hospital. I work for my group. I work for whomever, whatever the hospital says, I don't care about. No, you're, you're part of the hospital. You need to at least read the email. So focus on doing the right thing for the right reason. A, I think you're going to be fine 99% of the time. And B, when you're working on, on patient care, focus on uh, or at least follow the quality initiatives that are at your institution. And if you do that, I think you're going to be just fine. You know, there are lots of other things we can talk about from, you know, documenting when there are adverse events, making sure that, you know, you've got your witnesses uh, around you, whether that's the nurse, the janitor, the tech, you know, to write down their statements and, and be there if there was a, a adverse event. But realistically, the basics are what, you know, are going to decide 99 plus percent of these types of things. So you're saying that I'm not needing a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure on all my sepsis patients in the ER anymore? Nope, I don't think you have to float swans too often anymore. I, I haven't done one in a few years. <laughs> Let me jot that down. A couple notes here. Cut back on swans, gans, catheters. Got it. Swan gans. Not plural. Swan gans. Yeah, especially since you were doing them for a profit motive like the opioids are and you know, trying to drive up your billables. You know, We don't want you to end up you know, dissecting out something bad and uh, being criminalized here, my friend. <laughs> Pumping street-level fentanyl through the swan gans. Not ideal. 
Well, I mean, it reminds me a lot of, you know, of ACLS as well. You know, ACLS, there was so much stuff we used to do. And come to find out what we need is the pumpy blowy thing and find a reversible cause and stop it um, and reverse it. And so it really does boil down to there were so much broader things that we did. And now getting back to actually what is going to lead to a positive patient oriented outcome. And, you know, in the situation like the discussion we had uh, prior is there wasn't an oopsie daisy. There was, okay, oopsie daisy, missed something. But then another one, then another one, then another one. And, you know, 9 and 10 and 12 down the road, eventually you go from being an accident to being gross negligence and, you know, kind of willful, uh, willful endangerment, uh, wanton endangerment uh, of the patient. And that's, I think, where that crossover is that, you know, for the vast majority of physicians, nurses, and other practitioners out there, you're not going to get in, you know, if you're doing your job well, uh, as the best you can, you're not going to get in those situations where you have that Swiss cheese model of an aviation associated accident where 15 different things have lined up that turn it not just from a bad outcome, but to a criminal based outcome. But that may not be the case moving forward. You know, as we move forward, we're now seeing this tactic of turning physicians and ER staff into potential police forces by saying, we're writing in legislation that says, if you don't report this, then you can, you're can you going to be cl- uh, criminally liable. If you do this, you're going to be criminally liable, even though there is federal MTALA protections um, that have been clarified, but, you know, an 86 law put in practice at 87, and we still have that obligation as an emergency physician to take care, establish, evaluate for the medical screening exam, uh, assess emergent conditions and stabilize to the maximum capacity of our facility until appropriate disposition. So get into some of that tactic that we're seeing now in multiple laws uh, that have been out there and ASAP's been fighting many of them um, to criminalize health care as a way to promote and to fulfill legislation. I think that is the new frontier that we're starting to see. And, and I'd love to say we have case law on it uh, or even cases in the pipeline, but as of yet, we don't. So I think there's going to be that tension. And you know, we, as you mentioned, ASAP has taken a, a leading role on, on fighting this and joining you know, the AG and others uh, to really make sure that at the end of the day, we can do the right thing for the patient that's in front of us, uh, especially a, a patient that has a life-threatening medical emergency that under MTALA, we need to, to stabilize and fix. Uh, and so I think there will be some tension there. You know, but thinking about emergency medicine, I, I don't think we are going to likely be the ones, again, this is all politics, right? So th- there is the law, but the law is driven by politics and by politicians. So when you're thinking about the person you want to make the poster child for your first takedown in, in a state that's you know enacted some of these very restrictive abortion laws, going after the ER doc that it, you know saved a woman's life who you know stopped an ectopic pregnancy, uh, you know going after the the OB guy that took care of the ectopic pregnancy is not on the list of people you want to fight. You know you want to go after the not you you the people that are enacting these laws. You want to go after the elective abortion clinics. You want to go after the people that are, in their perspective, deliberately thumbing their nose at the law and are not doing it out of the health and safety of the mother. And that's the group they're going to go after first. So eventually may it get down to us, yes, and I think it's critical that we fight these issues as ASAP, certainly. But I think, again, back to our first conversation, if you're doing the right thing for the patient, you know, that's the right medical care, uh, at least when it comes to MTAL and emergency stabilization, I think we're going to be pretty safe and we're going to have the federal law on our side. doesn't mean that some crazy prosecutor somewhere won't necessarily try to press charges. I mean, that's how they get on the national news, right? Uh, so, you know, it doesn't mean you're not going to run into a crazy lawyer. A few of them exist. Uh, so, but I think, you know, in the end, we would win those kind of cases. Where I and think it- the challenge comes is in the willful and one. And then in the cases where we as ER docs are, you know, and some of the laws are, are challenging on this, say, you know, discuss, influence, or uh, steer, basically, a patient to get an abortion. And so if you're the ER doc talking to a newly pregnant person and saying, you know, are you connected with OB care? Do you want to be connected with OB? You know, and they say, well, I don't know if I want to keep the baby. You say, okay, well, if you're interested in abortion, there's Planned Parenthood or, you know, adoption or whatever, and you're presenting the classic 
set of options that we tell patients, you know, then that is where I think they might choose to come after us as emergency medicine, because one could argue that that is not an emergent issue. That's not an EMTALA protected issue. That's ongoing chronic care, not acute emergent care. So uh, that's where I think the diciness will come for us. And that, that is a challenge. I, I don't know that we can use EMTALA as a shield for that. And that is a reason you know, for each of our physicians out there to be active in state level politics. Because even here in Kentucky, when legislation came through, no matter what you feel about the um, access to reproductive health and um, the abortion issue, um, is making sure when that stuff comes up. Because when the Kentucky uh, legislation came through, looking at it and saying, hey, there's not protections here for emergent situations. And the return back was, well, it probably is just assumed. Well, this is legislation. Let's don't assume. Let's mark it out clearly in there that if you're going to do something, if you're going to write this law, no matter who agrees with it or not, we need to make sure that there is protections for the emergent situation, which EMTALA theoretically does, but at the same time also, I don't want to end up spending two or three years going in and out of court, paying the fees associated with it, because uh, as, as I understand, my uh, malpractice isn't going to necessarily cover criminal aspects of the world. Um, and so, you know, you want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Why we have to be active and that constant push against the criminalization of healthcare. We are not law enforcement and we don't need to be law enforcement. There needs to be a clear separation, just like we do on a daily basis, whether it's substance abuse or whatever. When they come to the emergency room, we are not law enforcement. We are there to treat and take care of the patient and do what's necessary to stabilize an emergent healthcare condition and get them where they need to be. And so we can't keep patients. That's the big concern is that by not only by uh, uh, criminalizing it, not only does it put fear within the, the physicians and other staff, but also within the patients concerned about seeking care. And so you have somebody that has an emergent condition, an ectopic pregnancy, um, or whatever it may be, and sits at home and ends up with a bad outcome because of fear. And that's what we have to maintain is that open accepting door into emergency medicine to say, if you've got an emergency, we're your people and you need to be here so we can help you take care of it. Um, so if that's any reason, no matter what topic it is, uh, as a physician out there to be active on your state and federal aspects of things on where they go, no matter which side of the abortion debate you're on, you know, the key is the access to care and emergency evaluation stabilization. Yeah, and I think you really hit the, the head there is, is that interfering with the doctor-patient relationship is that, you know, we are there to advocate for the patient's health, not to talk about criminal impact and all of those things. Uh, and, you know, I had it just this last week, a young man that uh, came in um, and was brought in by the police because he was drunk driving and ran into a pole, but, you know, started the windshield. <laughs> didn't want to let us draw his blood, didn't want to, you know, give us his urine, that kind of thing, and, because he was like, well, then it'll be used against me in court. And one of the things I, I thought about, I said, look, none of the stuff we do follows the evidentiary rules of chain of custody. It cannot be introduced into court. You know, they have, to, when they want a legal blood draw, they have to have the lab come up and draw it. They put it in a special sealed case. There are signatures. Every time it's opened, it has to be signed. I, you know, I, I use my lawyer background a little bit to educate this young man about, you know, the, the stuff I do doesn't meet the evidentiary standard. We toss it in a bag with a label on it and send it down in a tube system and pray that the lab gets it right when they cross it over into Epic. You know, like that, that's not the evidentiary chain of custody. So let me focus on the medicine. Let me focus on making sure you're alive. You'll deal with the legal stuff later. And, you know, it, it took a few rounds and I finally had the cop. I said, you agree, right? None of the stuff I'm going to do can be used against him in a court of law. He goes, yeah, it can't be. That's why I'm getting a warrant to get his blood drawn. He goes, oh, okay. Well, they can't draw my blood if I want to. I said, oh yeah, once they get a warrant, they can totally take your blood, dude. I said, but nothing you're going to do is going to stop that. So let's focus on keeping you alive here and get, get you some care. And then he recanted. And so to me, it's the same kind of thing where we're being asked to be stuck in the middle and where what we do medically could then all of a sudden be a criminal issue. That's interfering with our ability to deliver care. I pride myself on telling patients that generally what they tell me is not going to impact, you know, their criminal issues or things like that. You know, if they tell me that they're doing drugs, even with the police officers sitting there, you know, it, it generally doesn't, uh, isn't something that if I write it down, they can be used against. Maybe there's a admission against interest, hearsay exception for the police officer, but 
you know, I, usually not. So uh, I, I do worry about that, especially where it goes from, you know, lab testing is easy, right? You got to follow the chain of custody. We don't do that. Well, now all of a sudden we're talking about abortion and a patient says, well, I want an abortion. Where's the nearest state I can go to? You know, then all of a sudden our documentation may reflect that, right? We write down, here's your abortion clinic you know, address. That could be problematic. Uh, and our records could then maybe be used against them. You know, think about the discharge summary, right? You know, you give them the stack of papers, you say, here's your follow-up with abortion clinics are us, and the patient signs their discharge paperwork. Well, now they've signed it, they've acknowledged the receipt of this, could it be used against them in a criminal process? I, it's going to be up to a judge and a jury, well, a judge to decide if it meets the evidentiary standards, um, and a jury to decide whether or not they find that to be dispositive. But I, I really worry that these types of laws will put us in the place of where what we do for medicine could be introduced in a criminal element. And that that's concerning. That's an interesting question. Follow up question to that is, is say, Kentucky, you know, where the only major city that is not on a border is Lexington, like decent sized. Um, every other one, whether you're looking at northern Kentucky, Louisville, uh, Ash, uh, let's see, Ashland, you look at uh, Bowling Green, Pikeville, all of those are right on the border. Um, what what is that consideration with regard to potentially somebody crossing state lines, and, and that consideration that you know my state may have different legislation than that state? Is there any consideration we need to have when you have that potential that we're bringing two states involved? There has to be a joke somewhere about the definition of major city in Kentucky, but uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, there, I'm sure there. That's fine. That you, you just let it ride. We'll let it ride. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, the, you, you hit on a, a real challenging part of this, and this is where go back and read your state laws, because it, some states are just the administration of abortion. As long as you're not doing the abortion, you can tell a patient whatever you want, you know, within reason, obviously. Uh, but, you know, you can tell them whatever you want. As long as you're not doing the abortion, that's the criminalization. There are others that do talk about, you know, discussion, information, steering, you know, guiding patients to that. Uh, and each state is different as what they are criminalizing. In those states, I, that is a concern to me uh, because, uh, you know, like you said, Kentucky, you know, may not end up having any abortion clinics, but you could go across the river to Ohio uh, and, you know, uh, find a, a, an abortion provider. You might tell the patient, well, the nearest one here is X, Y, or Z in this state. Well, if that's guiding, steering, you know, directing um, or inducing, then you know that that does technically violate your state law. There's an argument again to be made about what the standard of care is and whether or not you can criminalize the standard of care, and that'll again be worked out in a court uh, with a judge. I, I would see that that's probably going to be problematic for prosecutors to uphold uh, that since it is part of the standard of care to include those things. But I think there'll be a criminal trial or two. And to your point, your malpractice may not cover it. Um, there are insurance companies now offering criminal legal uh, insurance. Uh, you can't uh, insure criminal activity, but you can insure against the cost of litigation. So one of our local insurers for $17 a year, they'll provide a quarter million dollars worth of legal fees uh, should you get criminalized. Uh, so I think that is a concern uh, that's out there. The other piece uh, that is tangential uh, to it in a way, but I think is the next phase in this evolution is to not just criminalize it, but to put it in your licensing. So, okay, we can't criminalize it, but we as the state of Kentucky have said, we don't believe in abortion and we don't want our people practicing it or educating to it or anything else. So we're going to put it in your you know, that long attestation that says, I haven't lost my privileges, I haven't lost my ability to provide Medicare, I haven't been kicked off of medical staff, I don't do drugs and alcohol, you know, I'm not impaired. There's nothing that necessarily prohibits them from adding a question that says, you know, I will not provide abortion services counsel or direct anyone on how to receive abortion services, whatever you want to put in there, uh, as the language. And then, you know, using that as the way that they come after us. Not criminal. But equally as damaging, you know, you lose your license in one state. If you're part of the interstate compact, you cannot then get a license in any other compact state. So, for instance, in Washington, where I am, 
we've got compacts with our neighboring states, Idaho being one of them that is slightly more red tinge than blue Washington, uh, to say the least. And so if you lost your license in Idaho, it would because you were doing abortions on the on the border between Washington and Idaho, it would then impact every other compact state. Uh, so I think that's the, the next evolution of this. If we can't get you for criminalizing it because it's just going to be too messy and too problematic to go after doctors that are just providing education. I, again, if you're doing active abortions, I think that's probably where they're going to go first. Uh, but if you're just providing education, just knowledge, hey, this is the nearest clinic, I think it's going to be tough to go after us with criminalization. I think they still will, um, but it'll be tough to, to win that argument. Uh, but I don't think there's anything that stops them from putting it into your licensing documents um, creatively and potentially then getting you for unprofessional conduct and yanking your license for that reason. Uh, and then once you've lost your license, that's a reportable event. You lose your interstate compact license. And if one state in the red side of the union you know, says that they've done this, there, others might choose to follow as we've seen with the abortion laws. And so as a result, you could see a domino effect where you could not practice in a number of jurisdictions that share that view on abortion. And so that might narrow your choices of where you want to live. And, you know, that people say, well, there's still 25 states or 20 states left that are going to have abortions. Go practice in one of them. Well, yeah, but maybe your family's in a state, you know, Wisconsin, you know, Kentucky, and your parents are old and aging and you want to go back and spend their last years living near them and practicing there. Well, all of a sudden you can't do that because you've lost your license because you told somebody something about abortion. And so I think it's not as simple as just go practice in one of those other states. Uh, and that's, I think, the next phase of this fight that I'm, I'm most worried about that I think will come for us. Even more reason that everybody needs to read all of that stuff when they sign up. Physicians, you need to read and uh, make sure you understand your contracts uh, before they come across. And, you know, it, it's... The argument that you know I've heard with regard to due process, well, it's no big deal. They'll just these some of these groups can just find you another place to work. It's like, well, sometimes you don't want to find another place to work. Sometimes you want there's a reason you're working where you're working, um, and maybe it is out of necessity, but maybe it's you know, like in my situation where I love to work, and so I just don't want to go to another hospital just simply because they can do that, and we don't want due process stuff within our contracts. But um, where do you see you, you mentioned? But that's our that that the concern being with the licensure boards, uh, potentially putting that as, as part of their uh, regulations. Um, where do you see otherwise this, and what do we need to do as physicians to ensure that we are not the as my dad used to say about contracting for a university chancellor position, you know, political football of using this as the. Um, as, as the carrot and the stick uh, to use the physicians, you know, federal is already using this to balance their budgets. Um, about the, the other side of this where um, it may be used as a political pawn uh, moving forward with legislation and the understanding that we're not going to have all the states on the same page. And so and we may see it different states across the country and it may be completely different. Indeed. And I think you could see this type of process where we are involved in the legal system way more than we want to be. Uh, you could imagine a world where people want mandatory reporting of drug abuse, uh, you know, and, and that, you know, other types of activities, you know, public vagrancy, you know, insert whatever the hot button issue of the day is. Well, if it intersects with us in the ER, let's have them make sure they're mandatory reporters. Now, that that's problematic to me, and that's the weaponization of healthcare, and it goes back to what you, it goes back to the interfering with our relationship with the patient, first of all, and doing the right thing for them medically. But secondarily, it goes back to the key of you've got to get involved in the politics in your state when these issues come up. It's critically important that you're involved in ASAP, you know, that you're involved in your state chapter uh, so that when these ideas come up, somebody's there to say exactly what you said, which is, well, let's not rely on EMTALA. Let's make sure it's clear in our law that there are emergency exceptions uh, to any sort of abortion ban may not be the end we want, but at least it, it stems the tide of harm to physicians. You know, be involved in your state medical association. Uh, you know, I've served as the, the president of both my uh, ASAP chapter as well as my state medical association, because I fundamentally believe if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. 
Uh, and uh, that's what we've done with the opioid epidemic, where we went from being uh, the uh, poster child of the problem and all the scourges of opioids were resulting from physician prescribing and spent the last decade working with the state government to the extent that last week, you know, in front of the Joint Legislative Committee, uh, the Department of Health came out and said physicians are no longer the drivers of the opioid epidemic, which was a huge win in a decade. You know, it seems like it's been forever, but, you know, that's the kind of thing of constant ongoing engagement and working with them to come up with solutions and tell them how what their brilliant idea is may actually do harm uh, is so important. And I know it's dirty sometimes and it's politics and nobody likes it. But on the flip side, it is so important that we are there to protect our patients, our ability to practice, our ability to deliver the care that our patients need. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't do anybody any good to not have physicians, nurses, you know, techs working in our departments because they've been scared off or they just don't want to work in that jurisdiction anymore. You know, I, I may not agree with what a state does, but I still want all of their people to get healthcare. I think we all do. So it's critically important we're involved in these processes and, and advocate with our time, with our energy, with our money. Uh, and if you don't have the time to do it because it's a long drive to your state capital, then support it with your energy and activation for your local electeds and with your money to get involved in the process. You know, NEMPAC on the national level, most state chapters have a, a PAC as well because you know money is important in the political process. So time, energy, and money, pick one, pick two, pick three, get involved. What everybody missed out on right there is uh, I decided to reset my internet to right as we're talking there. And thankfully, Nathan just decided to just finish it on up. We're, I'm going to find out when I get the recording later if you actually closed off the podcast or not. Uh, but uh, the things that happen with Zoom. So I'm recording my side. Thankfully, Zoom is recording his side, so that entire thought and conversation. But uh, talking here with Nation Schlicker, MD, JD, MBA, FACEP, LMNOP, got that whole uh, nurse manager badge going. So when you're telling, you're getting all that JD stuff in there, the badge is hitting your hip as well, just because it's hanging down there with all those letters. Uh, but uh, once again, love having you on the podcast. Great seeing you, and uh, you know, thanks for continuing to bring this out there and remind folks of the great work that ASEP is doing. Get involved, my friends, uh, but keep listening, and great content as always, my friend, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Well, we appreciate it, and what people are missing out on is the dramatic angle where he's got his camera set up. It's got him off to the side, so the, the bubble menu can show up on the side <laughs> with all the points uh, to keep me in check. Uh, but uh, wonderful guests. I love the information. Uh, I mean, and we have this group of physicians that have such a cool area of interest in being able to tie the medical, in this case, the legal aspect of things together. You learn a little extra Latin that you didn't know before. Um, and I've probably heard it a few times, but uh, just starting to, to sink in. And um, I really appreciate everything. How can folks get in touch? Did you give your contact information? If not, give your contact information. I did not give my contact information. So see, uh, I'll, I'll have to get better at this. You know, you're always welcome to reach me uh, via email, uh, Nathan at schlickerconsulting.com, uh, S-C-H-L-I-C-H-E-R consulting.com. Uh, or if you still use Yahoo like I do, S-C-H-L-I-C-N-R at yahoo.com. Happy to hear from you that way. Or if you got my number, give me a call uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you the next time I violate full roll and have to come back to the recidivism tent of uh, the Stanton uh, podcast plan. <laughs> Do you still have a prodigy? I know your Yahoo is your old prodigy account. I, I'm just Yahoo. I'm not. I'm not a prodigy anymore. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, my, my prodigy became my Yahoo uh, when it transitioned. For kids out there, prodigy was before Yahoo, which was before Google, back in the old days with dial-up, and you got your ten free hours and on your CD-ROM. Um, so. Topics that we can have for later. For me, you can contact me at rstantonatasep.org, rstantonatasep.org, at Everyday Med on the Twitter machine. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASEP Frontline.
If you're not on the front lines, you're on the sidelines. And with that, we've lost Brian Stanton. So this is Dr. Nathan Flicker for the ASAP Frontline Podcast. That is so his off because Dr. Stanton's gone. He'll <laughs> be right back. <laughs> I, I realized halfway through your call that you're a lawyer and a doctor. Yeah, I, I get in trouble. That's I, great. I, I, I have a, a few things, yeah, I've got all the things behind me now, so. Yeah, <laughs> ju- just a few. <laughs> so. I love it. Well, yeah, I, I did law school for med school and then I went back to my MBA because, you know, the, the hospitals don't listen to dumb doctors. We don't know anything about money. Like, I'll show you. I'll get my next merit badge now that I don't need ACLS anymore. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Recording in progress. Are you back, sir? Yes. So apparently they're messing with my internet downstairs. Oh, nice. Yeah. So. Let me see. I was I hoping like you would just you'd just keep talking. I was hoping it was just me. Oh, we did. I finished my thought. I said, get involved, time, energy, and money. I even signed off for you. You know, it worked well. Perfect. I assume Melissa has the recording, right? Oh, she's got it. That's, that's the reason we do it like this. Yes, and I, I, and I record I my own side. He's talking on mute. Should we tell him? Should we tell no, him? No, just because I turned off my other one. <laughs> I've forgotten. So you, you did finish your thought? I did. So time, energy, and money get involved in the political process is where it left off. 